Empire. Eligibility. It's more complicated than you could ever believe. I hear your, oh my God, sort of in, in, in your voice, like how could this be? And I think what you're really talking about is that the NCAA is, has a pretty prominent role in defining the scope and content of free, free collegiate schooling. And that's what you're talking about. And I think there's just a lack of understanding. Tim Michelson and Joyce Anderson found an honest game with the goal of making sure athletes get to and stay on the field of play. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein. Get good grades, stay within NCAA rules, another story in itself these days. Those are the criteria for staying academically and athletically eligible. Not so much. The fine print is thick, so much so Athletes can, unbeknownst to them, make themselves ineligible. And even worse, coaches and ADs might not know it's happening either. That's what Kim Michelson and Joyce Anderson want to fix. Our guests this week are Kim Michelson and Joyce Anderson, who are the co-founders of Honest Game, which is helping students stay eligible and find their athletic dreams come true with the right match. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having us. Um, Kim or Joyce, whoever wants to start, what is the genesis of Honest Game? Okay, great. Yeah, um, I think Honest Game is really a long time coming. Um, and it, it really, really emanates from uh, both Joyce and I have spent so many years in the sector um, working with students, uh, working with student athletes, um, working also in under resourced communities. and. When you work with enough students, you start seeing patterns. And one pattern that became really abundantly clear was a real lack of understanding about really the complicated uh, and well complicated rules and requirements to be academically eligible to play in sport, whether that's NCAA, um, NAIA rules. And what consequently what happened was many students that we had currently worked with um, were you know falling into these um, you know black holes of academic ineligibility and once that occurred it was pretty difficult to dig them out and there really wasn't a good solution there was no platform out there um, really that was tackling this and when we started to look a bit deeper we found that uh, almost a million kids a year um, can't really play can't go to college and play as a collegiate athlete student athlete because they were academically ineligible and then really became a bit more dire um, from a statistics perspective when you when you looked at students from under-resourced communities. And that was about half, 50% of those kids were academically ineligible. And so I think the, the, the genesis of all of this was really how do we, how do we provide, how do we use technology um, to really scale and make sure that the data has integrity so that every student uh, in this country and frankly worldwide has equal access, really an equitable opportunity to attend college. And, and for many of those students, sport is that vehicle. All right. So go back to, um, and I'll get into the technology in a moment, but, but go back to the idea of some kids get into kind of this black hole that they have a hard time climbing out of to, to get eligible to do this. I think just from the outside and hearing it, you think poor grades. Are, are you talking about something else entirely that affects eligibility for students who would like to play a- athletics in college? Yeah, absolutely. This is Joyce. Um, it is a, a three-factor um, eligibility requirement from the NCAA's perspective. So it's not just about your grades. You have to take a number of specific classes at your school, and every school has a different list of specific classes that are going to be NCAA approved. Um, you could be taking classes that you think are NCAA approved, but they're not. Um, and then that GPA that you need to get is based on only those NCAA classes. And so this NCAA GPA is something that you've probably never seen before because you see your school GPA, but it, the NCAA GPA isn't going to include any classes that don't appear on your school's approved list. So it gets pretty complicated. And then there's also a sliding scale with test scores. Um, SAT or ACT scores, and that will match up with your G- your NCAA GPA. So the higher your NCAA GPA, the lower your test scores allowed to be. Um, but the issue is, 
it could be any of those three things. Plus, um, you don't know if you're on track or not for sure until the NCAA has cleared you. Um, and they don't review you until you've been added by a college coach to an official institutional request list. They call it IRL. Um, and that might not happen until you're a freshman in college already. So there are kids walking around college campuses right now who are not NCAA cleared but don't know it um, and may even compete against the rules. And when that happens, huh. school can get penalized. They can lose championships that they've won and all sorts of things. Um, and it's because people don't have – the capacity or the time or the understanding to manage it all. Um, it's, it's super complicated. It changes all the time. And frankly, the burden of compliance really rests on high school, but they are very overworked. Um, and they, you know, they have enough to do what they're doing. And now we, we, in our country, we expect them to be academic eligibility experts. And this is kind of where some of the, some of the confusion comes in. This is amazing I, because it, Every each party involved here are they're incentivized to ensure eligibility. The student athlete is, the school is, the coaches are. How could there have this? How could this have happened? Really, I guess is what I'm asking. How could this be? Yeah, it's a it's really a challenging question. Like, how does it happen, and what what happens a lot of the times is um, lack of attention or awareness. Because it's not intentional. Of course, everybody wants every child, every student athlete to have that opportunity, right? But a lot of the issues are they find out too late. Um, the people in their village aren't educated enough to really know what the issue is. Um, maybe a student wasn't on on a radar as being a college athlete until that you know they grew like six inches at the end of their high school career. They you know put on you know fifty pounds of weight or whatever it was and. So it's, it, it's a combination of um, a lot of those things. And then also expecting somebody else is going to do it for me, right? Like somebody else has got my back. It's not going to be a problem. Um, and then, oops, that somebody didn't know or, you know, dropped the ball or made a, made a mistake. We're only human, right? So these dedicated counselors or coaches, they're sitting there with a napkin or some spreadsheet that they created trying to plug in the numbers and tracking things. It's too many kids. Um, and sometimes you, you know, check a box that you're not supposed to, or you, you didn't realize it. And then, oh my gosh, this, this happened to us, right? When we were work, working with kids, your heart drops into your stomach when you realize, oh my goodness, I might've made a mistake and the student might lose his scholarship and get sent home because there was a class that wasn't approved or he took the wrong class. I mean, there's scheduling things. You really have to be proactive about these academic choices. And if you're not, you can really be in a big hole and it can be hard to fix. But if you know what to do, it's not that hard, right? Being proactive and having the information is the key to success. Bram, one other point that I think is super interesting um, is, as you said, how could this happen? There are many high schools in this country that don't have any NCAA rule, any, any NCAA classes approved. Um, Joyce and I per personally have run into a bunch of them, which means that those students at that school will never be able to play in an NCAA accredited institution if they, if they don't have approved courses. Um, so there's just, you know, you've got that situation and then you've got situations of just needing to fix their courses and make sure they're updated. So it really is, you know, as I said, the burden is on the school um, and the people that are really at risk are these are, these, are our students. The, the kids who, who in that scenario, which I, I'm assuming is a minority of the schools that you're talking about, but like in that scenario where these schools don't have any classes that would make them eligible, to, would the student body be able to go to college and not participate in athletics? Could they, could they get into school? Yeah. Oh yeah. So you said, you know, your, your uh, admissibility is different than eligibility. Right. So like just because you didn't meet the NCAA or NAI requirements of participating in sports doesn't mean you can't be a student and go to college. But for a lot of students that, you know, the financial aid you receive or the assistance you receive in getting in is, is the ticket. And so if you don't have the opportunity to play sports, it's going to eliminate a lot of opportunity in general for college. Um, but the other thing is that like these students, are taking classes. They're they're working towards graduation. They're preparing for college at co at high schools that you know are called college prep or things like that. And sometimes they just don't know 
that they are holding children back. Um, and the percentage of schools without um, approved classes is higher than you would think. We're currently doing a study on schools across the country, um, and we're really getting shocked by the results that more schools than you would think are um, not preparing they're not preparing their school to give kids the opportunities. And you could go to junior college and then transfer. So that's an opportunity if you don't meet those initial eligibility roles. This episode is brought to you by KPMG Risk Services. KPMG believes that when you've earned the trust of all your stakeholders, that's when your business has a solid platform to grow. That's the trusted imperative. KPMG Risk Services develop and put in place dynamic risk strategies designed to help your business earn that all-important trust. Go to read.kpmg.us slash trust to learn more. I'm sorry if I'm coming off as completely naive to this, but I am. Like, what you're telling me doesn't even make sense. How could a student from a school do enough in high school to be eligible to be admitted to the student body, but not be eligible to play. That doesn't even make any sense to me. We had an investor whose daughter was earned a scholarship for a sport um, at the division one level. She had, I think a 3.8 GPA, school GPA, um, but she took an experimental English class for freshman year. And to be NCAA eligible, you've got to take four years of English um, or complete three years in your first three years of high school plus other. Uh, I'm not going to get into the weeds. But she didn't meet that, even though she had a high GPA and high test score, but her credit count was off. Um, what? <laughs> our software identified that so she could fix it. And she comes from a well-resourced family, right? So there are little hiccups that can happen. Um, that won't get caught until it's too late, usually. Yeah. And one other point I think I want to just mention, Graham, because I, I hear your, oh, my God, sort of in, in, in your voice, like, how could this be? And I think what you're really talking about is that the NCAA is, has a pretty prominent role in defining the scope and content of pre, pre-collegiate schooling. And that's what you're talking about. And I think there's just a lack of understanding. We say this all the time, that what we do it's different than tax code, but it's quite as, it's it's, it's as complicated. And we can also do international transcripts and decode that. And so it's its own specialty. Um, And so that's kind of why we're in this sort of vicious circle. Well, yeah, and also like the reason they do it, right? The reason they have these, it's it's the NCAA institutions who make the rules, right? It's not like the NCAA sitting on their mountaintop. It's actually the universities who are members of division one decide we want these rules to be in effect. And they do that because they want their students to be college ready. And so these uh, lists of approved classes are meant to say like, you need to take college prep courses. So when you get to my division one college, you're gonna be successful and you're not gonna drop out. I mean, there's so many studies that they're putting into and incentivizing um, retention, graduation, um, because those are really valuable to those D1 institutions and that a big reason why the rules have gotten uh, a little bit difficult to follow. They they are, but one other thing that's important to mention about that is that sometimes, and Joyce has tremendous experience with this, um, it's pretty subjective process about what classes will get approved and not approved. As Joyce mentioned, it's very much about college readiness, but sometimes the name of the class, like elementary college math, even if it says college um, or whatever it may be, the fact that it has elementary will make it not approved. And once it isn't approved, it's a big process to get it approved. This is nuts. I, it, it really is. Like, I, I just, I'm thinking about like kids in, I don't know, under, you know, privileged communities who are going to public high schools and are looking at scholarships for some athletic discipline as a ticket to get into college and they're jumping over hurdles they didn't even know existed. Like, this is crazy, yeah. really. And the reason, yeah, yeah and, and the reason, Bram, is so important, obviously, we don't, I don't want to get too big, sort of big picture here, but as Joyce mentioned, yes, they could meet the admissions requirements and go to that college. But we are living in this, the world right now where 
in the last several years, I think the last 10 years, college has grown. The price of college has grown at a rate of eight times the average. Um, and so, and then, right, the majority, and then I think 75% of kids, there's stat, something like 75% of kids um, are in default of their, on their loan. So, I mean, if we're really trying to set um, the next generation and future generations up for success, um, you know, the, there are, you know, the number of college scholarships has grown. I think it's in excess of $3 billion now. And it's just such a partial scholarship. So it is a vehicle for social mobility uh, and for opportunity. Um, and so that's why this is really, you know, we feel like it's a really important problem to solve. Yeah, college student athletes are much more likely to graduate from college than the national average. So it's almost like 30% more likely, depending on which division you go to. And and Kim and I were both athletes, right? Kim was the first female in the state of California to play varsity boys baseball and basketball. I was a division one athlete um, in tennis. And we just know what sports gives young people, right? Like, from the beginning, you learn all those intangibles of teamwork, leadership, confidence. But then when you get to college, you have family on campus. You have social emotional support. You have tutoring. You have academic advising and career counseling and all these other networks um, that are provided to you if you are, you know, able um, and, you know, lucky enough to participate in college athletics. And we just want to give that to as many kids as possible. All right, so- and, the, and the brand to use data, to use data to do it. Like, this isn't just something that Joyce and I feel you need to do and it's subjective. It's data um, that drives, hopefully, people to make better decisions in a very unemotional way. Um, I, I, let me just say this to all the parents out there that, that might hear this. I, I think they're all thanking you for stepping in because, like, this is this is a quagmire that doesn't need to exist. Um, tell me a little bit about the technology. Um, what exactly do you do? Yeah, so we have a software. and it- takes in your school transcript. We don't take self-report. So you can't like say, I got an A in English. It actually has to be a, a school document showing what your classes and grades were. Ours is software. We'll pull it in and then it spits out a dashboard for you. And every time you get a new transcript, it'll give you a new report. And that report provides tracking of every class you've taken, letting you know what your numbers are, like how far along are you? Are you on track? We've got averages that you've got to hit We tell you what your special NCAA GPA is. There's a toggle where you can slide to see, like, okay, on the sliding scale, if my GPA is this, what test score do I need to get on the SAT or ACT? Um, And then we give short-term goals. So we'll say, hey, if you get an A in this class, your GPA goes up to a this. If you get a B, your GPA does this. If you get a C, your GPA does that. Um, And then we'll track all of those requirements for Division I, Division II, and AIA, we're adding D3 and JUCO this week. Like every couple of weeks, we're adding some really exciting um, features to our app. Um, in a few months, we're going to have admissibility features in there. So if, if you're in D1 tab, you can say, hey, I want to see what the D1 colleges are. And then which ones do I fit academically for admissions um, on top of my eligibility? And then on top of that, we're suggesting, hey, maybe you don't meet the requirements for D1. Um, you need to do X, Y, and Z, take summer school, take these classes in these subject areas. Um, and if you don't make it, how about D2? Or if you don't make it, how about, you know, these other opportunities so that kids always see it's it's not about, I'm not going to, I'm, you know, don't give up, right? There's always an opportunity if you keep working towards, you know, your dream. And we're really trying to pair that student athlete passion for sports with a motivation for learning to increase learning outcomes overall. Are you flagging things for student athletes as well? Saying like almost yeah. preemptively saying, you know, if you take this class, there's a problem here. Yes, absolutely. Classes are flagged. We have a, a, a red, yellow, green light system. So if you're green for now, you're good. Just keep working. If you're yellow, caution, right? If red, like dire situation, you really need to think about something, but for we track kids as early as middle school, but most of the kids in our software today are between freshman and senior year in high school. And so if it's a freshman, it's the best because we have so much more time to advise and track and push. Um, but even seniors, Kim and I, when we first met, um, we were working with a number of student athletes who are being recruited by pa- um, Power Five, and we helped them strategize. And that's how we came up with the idea of our software is that like, if we can automate 
human strategy on how to get eligible classes to take, what's your GPA. Um, it will allow people to, you know, the, the adults in the student's village to properly guide them. So it's not just about giving the students the proper information. It's about giving the parent and the counselor and the coach. And we give that dashboard to all of the adults in the student's village so that they can properly guide that student. And we know kids, 14, 15, you're not necessarily thinking about does my English class count for NCAA, but just seeing that red light will make them think, oh, there's something wrong. I need to fix it now before it's too late. Mm-hmm. All right, let me get one big picture thing before I let you go and, and where you, but what's your perspective on name, image, and likeness coming into NCAA sports? I think, you know, it's, that's a great question. And I think that's on a, from a bigger lens, um, you know, we think of the sort of sports, uh, high school, collegiate sports, all of it is really over the last, um, has had gone through remarkable innovation. The, the academic side of it is almost stood still. So I think we're just kind of bringing that along. I think, you know, there's at this particular point, um, at least for high school athletics, um, California is the only state um, that from a high school student athlete, you can work on and get an NIL um, and, and, you know, use NIL to get kind of, some kind of partnership and all of that. So I think we're still learning um, about how it's going to evolve and how it's going to change. And, you know, this kind of goes to an important point, Graham, it's really our name on the team. We want to, that was a very de- deliberate choice. I think having spent a significant time in the sector, both Joyce and I felt that many of the companies out there uh, were somewhat predatory and they were offering things that they necessarily, that they, they were more subjective in nature, not really data driven and um, really maybe, maybe drove to this sort of predatory sort of environment where every, you know, and we didn't want to do that, which is why we said using data to drive honest, you know, honest decisions and integrity. And so I think when I, Joyce, you may have different views on this, but I think from an NIL perspective, we're learning and we want to make sure that we're communicating to, you know, our more than 30,000 users on our platform, um, what they have to be aware of. For example, you know, if they were to get an, you know, NIL deal, they have to pay taxes on that money. So we just, we want to use data and drive insights and opportunity and make sure that we're educating and it's not a predatory, um, you know, that our tool is really about data and not an, an honest data and integrity and nothing that, nothing that is predatory. Yeah, and NIL is creating so many more opportunities for students in college, right? Like even, you don't have to be at a top power five program to participate in NIL. And so the value that is being a college athlete is skyrocketing in itself, which means you have to get your academic stuff in order even more so now. Um, and so it's just much even it, NIL makes our academic tool or software that much more valuable to a young person because they, they now have even more incentive to make it so that they can access that opportunity of college athletics. Kim Michael said that Joyce Anderson are the co-founders of Honest Game. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you Thanks for having us. This episode is brought to you by Verizon. The experts have spoken. Verizon has been named America's most reliable network by Root Metrics, proving there's only one best network. Best and most reliable based on rankings from the Root Metrics U.S. Root Score Report, dated first half 2021. Your results may vary. On the next Future Sport Podcast, health management and optimal training meet. As you start to get further into it, you realize oh, hey, what if we looked at every spike in acceleration and started to see, okay, well, you know, what happens at every spike in acceleration? And actually, for the other 99 previous spikes in acceleration, there's no injury. And then you start to realize, huh, maybe that wasn't what led to it. That's Stephen Smith, CEO and co-founder of Kitman Labs, where the understanding of the athletic body is growing by leaps and bounds. That will do it for this episode. As always, the future is now. This is the Future Sport Podcast. I'm Bram Weinstein.